Hi, everyone. Today, we're happy to welcome David Long to the Integral Stage for another Integral Stage Mind Walk with Lehman Pascal. David's well known in our community and doesn't need much of an introduction. He's been a prolific producer of integral content on his YouTube channel for a number of years, where he has offered introductory and critical perspectives on integral theory. The reason we invited him here today is to talk about some of his criticisms, particularly around the pre-trans fallacy and its use and application in the integral community and integral literature. So without further ado, I'll turn the stage over to Lehman Pascal and David Long. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Everybody in the integral community has a basic understanding of the importance of the pre-trans fallacy and of the, uh, the contribution that Wilbur made in clarifying that for the general meta and integrative communities. So everybody kind of, everybody would honor that piece, but from your point of view, what do you think people generally don't understand about it or don't appreciate about it properly? Well, I would agree with you that everybody in the integral community knows the words transrational. But I do not think that most people in the integral community really know what it means, even based on Wilbur's own standards, in part because Wilbur himself seems to be kind of confused about this stuff and commits this fallacy in a pretty major way, I would say. So what do so, you think people mean when they say transrational? Well, this is what I call farsighted mishmashing. It's like a green problem. And you see it all over the place where people take two words that look similar and like they're from different language games and they conflate them for for example like the thing that happens around this idea of like of the secret and quantum physics and stuff like that like people take the word observer the observer effect from quantum physics and observer from buddhism and they're like ah oh, my consciousness the observer collapses the wave function so I create reality. And so they come up with this new idea that's not really a part of Buddhism and not really a part of quantum science, that's like this new hybrid out of conflating terms that are the same. So we have that same kind of thing happening here where people are thinking like transrational means like, like they think of it in like a Buddhist context still like, oh, I'm trying to stop all this rational talking in my mind. And when I get to a point where like, I'm beyond just that talking voice, then I'm in a transrational state. They might even think of it as if it's a state, but it's not a state, it's a developmental distinction. So they're kind of confusing states and stages in that way. We're not talking about some kind of Buddhist transmental state, we're talking about ways of understanding symbolism from a stage of development beyond the rational stage. So like people will come into the community in part, I think because Wilbur's telling people things like you're already integral. If you, if you hear the sound of my voice and you're listening to me, <laughs> you just need to learn some of the words and stuff. And so they think that they already know what it means. They're used to hearing these distinctions and they end up conflating these different things and thinking that they already know what it means when they don't. How much of that do you think is based on a, an unnecessarily narrow understanding of what rationality is? In the same sense that people might have an unnecessarily narrow understanding of science, and then they're right. very interested in putting science next to all this other unscientific stuff they embrace, when in reality, science could include a whole huge chunk of that stuff, but in a clearer way. Yeah, I definitely think that's part of it. I think that even thinking that like your mental activity is rational <laughs> is not understanding what rational means anyways, you know what I mean? So if, if people are confused like that, they, you know, I think that the problem, like one of the main problems in general in our, in our culture at large is that when it comes to the orange stage of development, people aren't really taught rationality and logic and these tools that well. Like people are really good at being orange achievers, but you hardly really that often see people who are really good at using logic and rationality and stuff like that. It's, it's a very common problem. There's a problem at all the stages, and I often think of it relative to the orange stage, which is the problem of 
uh, being an inauthentic version of yourself or an incomplete version of yourself. And one of the main things about that is the inability of a level to regenerate itself, to provide the conditions that it needs in order to flourish. So I see a lot of the modern world consisting of people who don't actually have the skills to generate modernity out of themselves. They, they almost inherit an amber version of orange, which is they're just yes. told to believe in the orange consensus reality. And they weren't taught to cultivate the skills and experiences and context that orange comes out of. Yeah. I mean, in general, I think this happens anytime people move up into a, like uh, the convention includes a new stage of development. What happens is that we don't really often build a conveyor belt or bridges up to those stages. And so as modernity becomes the new conventional or as post-modernity becomes the new conventional, what you'll see is that most people will adopt those ideas in traditional ways. So this is kind of a cool thing, I think, about a more in-depth understanding of the spiral is that it's not just about the words that people say, but understanding what motivates those words. So like when we are doing developmental tests and stuff, we always ask why, because that really gets to the root of why a person is saying what they're saying. So for example, someone in a, you know, coming up in a green society might hold like the idea of don't judge as like a, something that they would value, but they don't, they're not necessarily saying it because they're coming from a green perspective. What they might be doing is trying to protect their own ego. So they're appealing to some kind of cultural dogma, like don't judge, meaning <laughs> let me do what I want to do. Right. You know, you don't get to judge me. Right. And then exactly. there's Amber teams and on Amber teams, the other side is judgmental and we are non-judgmental. Right. And then you right. get some kind of orange. I mean, I think one of the things we see in the American political system right now that's problematic for a lot of people that are trying to figure it out is a lot of what seems like green is actually orange marketing. <laughs> right. That's that's and there's a lot of progressives too. saying those people don't actually represent us. There's a huge confusion there. Yeah. And that's and that's, I think, part of why sometimes people are like, spiral dynamics is too simple it doesn't work or something like that it's like well there's a there's like a level one understanding of it and like deeper and deeper ways of and honestly this kind of thing that we're talking about now we're using the spiral and the understanding of these different lines to actually make more nuanced distinctions than than you would be able to do if you didn't have this terminology terminology well, once you so. have those chunks it gives you other possibilities you can say well, how do those chunks fit together, right? What's, right? what's an amber version of green? What's an orange version of green? What do these things look like on different lines? And um, what do they look like? This is one thing that always interests me, content versus style. Because, I mean, we have a very easy conversation where we say, orange can invent a nuclear warhead and amber or red barbarians can deploy it. But we don't often think so clearly about uh, conceptual tools, right? Somebody comes up with relativity and it can be deployed down the line and if you find somebody running around screaming about relativity they're not necessarily invoking anything green it's only nominal green content but there's no green style it's just that style is a much harder thing to test for when you're trying to grade somebody's developmental levels yeah i like the idea of style i would almost say like content versus intent or something like that something but yeah i mean it's a it's an interesting distinction that actually you don't see that many people in, in, in integral making. And I think part of this is because a lot of people in our community don't really know the theory or have a very surface level understanding of the theory, in part because of this idea that if you hear the sound of Ken Wilber's voice, you're already integral. <laughs> um, a lot of these people are coming from a more postmodern community and they just bring a lot of that stuff with them. And they don't, because they're not really that into orange and maybe even demonize orange and never really got orange that much in the first place, they're not really that interested in the theory. It's like a, our community is filled with like a lot of people who come from like a new age background and also like academics. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very strange uh, so, combination. You know, from your point of view or from your feeling about the community's potential, is that problematic? Or, or is there a role for people like that? Are they, are they a useful, necessary component that you just have to figure out where they fit and what they should do? Or are they um, trans fats taking the place of healthy fats? <laughs> I, don't think it's, I don't think it's a problem 
that these are the people in our community. What I think is the problem is that there's a lack of structure and leadership in terms of being able to integrate and guide these, the, our community. And so uh, even in a lot of our groups, there is a lot of really toxic and um, unskillful stuff happening in there. And for the most part, the leaders in a lot of those groups kind of have a very hands-off a democratic or relativistic kind of approach where nobody really ever guides or intercedes on anything. And so I think what happens in a lot of cases is the more wise and intelligent voices get drowned out, or even they just leave because they're frustrated with the quality of conversation. And unfortunately, a lot of the worst actors and bad voices uh, win the space. And so it's a major problem. We haven't been um, cultivating the kind of community that we would that we would like to have the like the, the the type of values and virtues. Actually, this is something that I've been working on trying to do in my integral group a little bit. And what I've what I've been trying to do in terms of creating this kind of culture is that the vibe is like a combination of both healthy support and challenge, right? And so you as a participant in this community are gonna be held to a kind of a standard of, of being able to know when you know what you're talking about and also know when it's time to respect the expertise of others. Like, can you learn in public? Like you get respect points for learning something from another person and letting yourself be vulnerable like this in public, like in this kind of growth mindset. So, I mean, I do think that as I've been thinking about it and cultivating it, that there is this integral kind of community and values that, that emerges, but you, but you really have to shake people out of their normal ways of, of communicating in groups out of uh, ego and with, an, with an attitude because people who aren't used to engaging in this way aren't going to really know how to do it. It takes some practice, it takes some time, and it takes some humility and openness and honesty to be able to engage in this way. But it's really good practice and it will grow you. So I think when we meet together in this kind of a way, it's really powerful. And that's how it should be in an integral space, I think. Some of it has got to just be the limitations of the particular medium in question, right? Like this, a Zoom chat is quite different than an open Facebook group. And, yeah. you know, as, as integral as we'd like to be, you're always going to get some of that Facebook sensibility or some of that Twitter sensibility in those spaces. Yeah. Uh, and yet at the same time, like you say, uh, I think there's definitely a role for something like leadership to step up a little more in support and challenge. And there's also room, I think, for um, a wisdom that looks like an etiquette, right? That we can't presume in advance, but that we work it out together, you know, what counts as real communication or as valuable communication. Absolutely. And one of the ways I've been trying to help with this a little bit is I've been encouraging all the members to make video introductions because, ah, here comes the train. <laughs> um, because one of the things that I've noticed is that when you don't just see somebody as an icon on your screen. You can start to break some of this because it's really the personal connection, seeing somebody as a person that allows you to both be kind and respectful to them. And, not, and like, so I think that's, that's important, but there's other things we could do too. But, you know, in, when people talk about the, the limits of the format, that's what I'm thinking it is. If there's a limit, it's the, it's the fact that we can't see each other and that it doesn't seem as personal and it feels like you're hiding behind some kind of a, a persona and we're not really hearing each other or getting the feel for each other. There's a real disconnect between the concept of community and the actual conditions that allow communities to be generated. When I used to be a moderator at the Integral Life Forum, I, I was always sort of agitating on this topic, which is in the degree to which we are a space where people use typing to communicate their opinions linguistically, we're never going to be a community, right? Every real community is based in other things. It's based in transactions and bodies and relationships. You know, if there was, if this was a 
opinion expression space and a dating site and we were hiring each other for jobs and selling each other our sofas we'd have a better chance because those are the conditions that real embodied human beings derive their community sensibilities from yeah i think that's true and uh, i do think that you know going forward with a little bit of maybe organization on the the bottom end where we can set up kind of cross collaboration between places we also all really need to re-step it up and re-go out into the world again and hold space for real life real world integral relationships in our community and and start to cultivate that more to what degree does that address the problem of people who are embracing the irrational as if it was the transrational to the degree that we're not really able to have good communications about this kind of stuff. And there's problems with authority and there's no debates. There's no real way to engage. And it ultimately kind of just gets deflated into different people being like, no, it's no, my opinion, no, your opinion kind of a thing. But for me, like the reason I even came to the integral community and saw it as an exciting thing in the first place, or maybe one of the original reasons that I resonated with Ken Wilbur was because my first or maybe most impactful major teacher in my life besides Ken Wilbur is Joseph Campbell. And as a person who was raised in a really religious home, and I spent a lot of time studying those symbols and then having lost that and deconstructed it and being interested in other symbol sets like Buddhism and really feeling the importance of religion and spirituality. Finding Joseph Campbell was really helpful and important to me because he really helped me. He was, I would say, the first implicitly integral teacher that I ever had. Like if you understand Joseph Campbell's projects, his methodology and what he's doing, he's doing a meta-analysis and understanding like the universal cultural and personal themes and sort of like taking this very integral perspective on religion. And when I came across Wilbur, he seemed to be doing this too. In fact, like one of the early intro materials that I started watching was his Cosmic Consciousness interview series. And in that, he he explicitly says that he gets this idea of the pre-trans distinction, pre-trans rational from Joseph Campbell, and that he was a big fan of Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, probably the recent era's greatest mythology and interpretive mythology, and somebody I certainly cut my teeth on it. I was a great admirer of his and the really extraordinary work that he did. He used to very, very uh, vehemently, actually, say that there's really sort of two types of mythology, or mythology forms two different functions. He wouldn't use the terms pre-rational and transrational, but the way we're talking about them is the way he would talk about these two functions of mythology. And the first function is when mythology is taken to be concretely real. But what some people do, particularly educated, intelligent people like us that are trying to get some meaning in our lives, we can tend to take myths as deeply symbolic of something else. Campbell knew this as if the capacity to form a cognition that says it's as if this is the case or it would be, it's transrational. It can represent a deeper self, a higher self. It can represent oneness with all of reality. The Christ mythos itself is, is made to order for all sorts of interpretations. So that's a very, very distinguishing way to tell the difference between pre-rational myths that are taken to be concretely, literally true, and trans-rational myths that may represent some very high transpersonal dimensions. So, that, so as long as we take both of those into account, then we have the sort of more integral overview. And the problem, again, with the pre-trans fallacy is that people like Freud take every trans-rational as-if higher mythology and reduce it to two-year-old infantile nonsense. And on the other hand, way too many people take a lot of the pre-rational stuff and elevate it to trans-rational glory it just doesn't have. From the outside, how do you know if this person's operating at a pre-rational or trans-rational level? Would it be if they were able to say, I'm going to act as if? Yeah. Well, first of all, you ask them exactly what, what is it that you're doing. If they're making an empirical claim, check it empirically. On the other hand, it can be a very high kind of metaphoric and as if interpretive tool or war sharp block. He says that Campbell talks about it the same way that he would talk about it, except for an in integral, we speak about it in developmental terms. So that's the difference. That's the difference between the integral pre trans rational versus what Joseph Campbell was doing. Basically, Joseph Campbell says that traditional people take their symbols literally, and rational people also take the symbols literally. So they're like, no, that's wrong. That's false. <laughs> that's not true. It doesn't hold up. It doesn't work. And then some people are able to read the symbols poetically, psychologically, as archetypes of 
humanity grasping to try to understand what's going on in reality and that there are deeper truths to be found in these things. So there's a that area right there that um, maybe you're at the intersection of, which is a couple of different factions within the integral community would hold the ontological status of the poetic differently than others, right? When you say psychological, some people will have a certain association with that where they're basically inhabiting a rational material universe and they're investigating an abstract subjective element. And some other people would think based on their experiences and or fantasies that they're describing a kind of additional reality of some sort, whether it's explored or thought well through or not. Where do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, this is a problem and it all comes back to um, epistemology and methodology. Like, do we have that? I mean, this is why understanding the tools and the philosophy is so important because what a lot of people are doing are they're working backwards from some kind of a religious idea, which would be a pre-trans fallacy. And then they're, they're building all this other stuff on top of it. So if you don't have a rational worldview that is founded from the ground up and, and makes sense and is, and is solid. Um, and if you don't, it's like, if you don't have a good foundation, everything you build on it is questionable and is going to be potentially problematic. So this is, this goes back to this issue with Wilbur for him, everything is arising in consciousness. And it all starts with him taking Buddhist or Hindu creation myths, literally. And then he builds everything on that. And even if you look at his ideas about Tetra arising and he brings up philosophers like Whitehead and all this stuff, this is storytelling. This isn't rooted in any kind of evidence. And the evidence that he does bring to the table isn't really sound. I wouldn't even say that it's logical, let alone verified empirically in any kind of a way. In his video about subject becoming object, he talks about how if you slowly see, okay, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this, then eventually you find this kind of like, this like witness self or this like a uh, pure being that you can't deny or like this idea that before the universe was I am like he thinks that if you can close your eyes and you can get rid of everything and you can turn off everything and rest in pure being that that's kind of like finding this true source of everything and to me that's looking in the wrong quadrant for data you don't get to make claims about the nature of reality based on looking in your own interior consciousness and it's a, just, a lot of the terminology is ambiguous <laughs> i find the word consciousness pretty problematic in a lot of ways because it's very difficult to tell whether someone's referring to a quality like the abstract quality of being perhaps right you could say that every quadrant had being or existence of some kind Sure, and sure. That you might find at the root of the subjective quadrant, the presence of the thing that is at the root of all the quadrants. But it's very different when people start to talk about consciousness as if it was simultaneously the particular subjective quality and the underlying existential quality of all the other quadrants. Uh, yeah. Right now, whatever opinion people take of any of those different perspectives, most of the conversations are really tangled and aren't clear enough in their vocabulary to even be a conversation yet, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, Use, the, using the right words and getting the right terminology is difficult. But it seems to me the way to establish what's primary is not to run this kind of an experiment that he's talking about. Like that's very much caught up in this sort of circular reasoning and confirmation bias of Buddhism. So um, two questions then. On the one hand, okay. what would you consider is a methodology to determine what is primary? The other question is, to what degree have you had those same kinds of experiences he's talking about? And if so, how did you frame those to yourself? Okay, well, I'll take your second one first. Uh, I used to agree with him. I used to think that he was right about this. And it was only through, and honestly, like I learned a lot through disagree or through like going through this process of trying to figure out if he was right or not. Like, I don't like in the same way, I don't think it's good evidence to be like, Oh, I close my eyes and the world disappears. Therefore consciousness is primary. It's like, okay, well we could kill you. You disappear and the world still exists. 
So the world is primary. Like that doesn't, it's like, it, it's not a good bit of logic. To me, if you're going to establish um, that consciousness goes all the way down and back or something like that, you would have to do it reasonably. You'd have to, you'd have to make a good case for how you know that based on what we can see and measure. So like if you correlate the interior phenomenon that is potential that can arise to the exterior equipment that allows for a lot of that, I think that we can start to see that the material is primary. The functions don't come online until the equipment is there to allow for them. So as things evolve, they gain more capacities. And a lot of this stuff goes back to idealistic underlying assumptions just held from the beginning that there must be something more than, than reality, than things. And from my opinion, of course, I would say that there's more than just the physical world. Obviously, consciousness is an emergent, but th this goes back to your idea of like understanding what consciousness is. Is consciousness just software or is it some kind of other realm or other, you know, like for the Tibetans, the Book of the Dead, they speak about these archetypes like as if it's like this bardo realm, this kind of like real realm between the source of everything and manifest reality as we know it and so as you die you kind of have to navigate through this archetypal realm to get back to source it's an interesting cosmology but it's not a rational cosmology it's a pre-rational cosmology from a time before we had microscopes and telescopes and we understood the fractal nature of our reality which also has to do with understanding what we are because if you think of yourself as this one individual thing instead of a whole on in this much larger process, that's, this is where you can get the idea of an individual and individual selves and individual souls. It's all very, very old fashioned ways of thinking. What was, what was your first question? What's the methodology by which we determine what's primary? I would say it's a question about the nature of reality. So we have to we have to use exterior methodologies. We can correlate them to, to the phenomenology, but you can't just appeal to first person evidence. I'm not saying that we shouldn't include first person evidence, but it's not reducible to that. We have to look at evidence from all the quadrants and find out what the best explanatory power is. Like this is what we would call something maybe like tetra validation or something like that. Yeah, my impression of the quadrants is, and the way people talk, even the way Wilbur talks a lot of the time, seems to confuse this, which is yeah. they're only quadrants if you can make a good argument that everything else could be reduced to them. And then there's four of those, right? Like you were saying, I can exclude all of the material and get to something that seems basic for me. But materially, I could be excluded and there would only be material left, right? And there are these at least these four zones in which you could make a similar argument. People make a social construction argument, or you could make a patterns and computations are fundamentally real and material isn't argument you know, in the lower right. So it yeah. seems to me that's the only thing that really validates the notion of quadrants is that they're all equally capable of reducing each other to themselves, but yeah, which and we use for which circumstance. Right. Yeah. And this is actually one of the things that I'm proud to feel like I've contributed to integral theory is this idea of nested quadratic holons. Because I think on the other side of just being like, well, there's four quadrants and they go all the way down and back. If you don't think that they go all the way down and back, then you're coming up with this nested quadratic holons where different quadrants arise inside of different quadrants. Right. So if reality is primary, then maybe the exterior quadrants are primary and the interior quadrants arise inside of them. So what then I noticed is, is that this applies to a lot of different things. So if we're doing epistemology, then interiority is primary. And the other quadrants arise in our consciousness as we perceive them, and we have to take that into account. So the primacy is different and the nesting is different depending on what category we're talking about. And I think this goes to something like accuracy too, right? Like 
probably our most founded and well-established theories are the most accurate things that we could potentially have in terms of understanding reality. While first-person experience, though it can be the best way to understand what we're feeling, what we think, all these kinds of things, first-person experience is probably one of the least reliable forms of evidence. Like they have those tests where they have people passing a ball back and forth and you're supposed to count the times that they pass it. And at the end, it asks you how many times and you're like, oh, 15. And then they're like, yeah, but did you see the gorilla? And they're like, gorilla, what gorilla? But then if you rewind it back, a gorilla walks through the screen and like pounds his chest and goes through. So it's like, there's so much stuff that we aren't perceiving. And honestly, this is why science was developed in the first place. So that way we could try to deal with the fact that our perceptions are so incredibly inherently limited and to try to use peer review to establish a truth that anyone could find if they perform the injunction. So this is where, you know, peer review and all these things come in. Of course, science starts with inherent assumptions as well, but I think the fact that science works establishes and proves these assumptions, you know, that there's an objective reality that is what it is, regardless of what another person might think about it. And so- Yeah, there's a real shift there. The orange, some huge thing happened at orange. Right, and we normally associate that with exteriors, right? We talk about scientific materialism as if it left out a bunch of other stuff. And maybe the reason it left that stuff out is those other zones haven't quite caught up to a verification system of equal rigor. Right. right? Before, in my mind, I often think of orange as a double checking system where reason is something like double checking thoughts and science is like double checking your idea against evidence and that pre orange peoples. They never double checked. (laughs) They went with a completely different verification system. Uh, But how limited is that is that orange shift to the material universe? To what degree can we say there's a subjective version where you no longer trust your interpretations of your subjective phenomenon, but instead we look at the functional and quantitative metrics and inherent logic of your subjective phenomenon and to what degree could that be applied even maybe to the states you know if there's a subtle state what's an orange take on the subtle state versus a pre-rational take on that state and this is the work that integralists should be doing you know what i mean that we need to like we're supposed to be the synthesis of orange and green and and mostly it's just green it's but or orange. And there are very few people who are actually doing this kind of really rigorous, open, honest, skeptical kind of inquiry to really want to rigorously see what we can establish. To me, the Integral Project, it's a continuation of both the Eastern and Western Enlightenment project. A lot of us understand what the Eastern Enlightenment thing is about, you know, deconstructing the self and realizing unity the Western Enlightenment project is about using intellectual honesty to try to really understand and establish what's actually true in a reasonable way. And this is going to be really important if we're ever going to transition into this integrally informed stage to come together, to build groups, to build societies, to build new systems together. We are going to have to really get past this idea of like, incorporating what we like and this super personal version of integral and try to figure out what the universal fair version of integral is, especially if we're thinking about trying to, I mean, let's be frank, impose it on future generations as the new system. It's going to be really important that we get it right. And it can't be just reducible to a person's bias. We can't have Ken Wilber over here being like Buddhism and Steve McIntosh over here being like, no, we can do Christianity and believe in a literal God. Like if we're going to be able to do this thing, we have to have fair overarching standards. We have to have a version of religion that's not reducible to one of these different mountaintops. We got to do it more Joseph Campbell style and have a holistic, fair, overarching understanding of integration. And before I move on, I want to also say that I think that 
there's a major tendency to straw man materialists as if they're all empirical reductionists. And they exist. I'm not saying that they don't, but anybody at a rational plus stage of development can be a more realist person and take into account all these quadrants and to try to act like all these people who have a more realist view of cosmology and reality are just these simplistic empirical reductionists is dishonest and it gets into this kind of straw manning, pretending to be higher and sure, just dis- yeah. dismissing people. And that becomes a major theme the in the community. The communities get community. caught in that cul-de-sac quite a bit in their discussion. Yeah. I mean, one thing that's not immediately obvious to a lot of people, it seems to me, is that the the as-if perspective, the ability to embrace a set of phenomena and experiences without uh, giving them an absolutistic ontology, that that's applicable not just to the poetic. It's also applicable to the rational. Absolutely. We don't have an absolute reason to believe that our reason is effective. We hold it as if it's effective and we test it out, same as we do with the poetic. So if we can treat if, you know, Those groups ought to be able to treat each other as brethren in that task. All we have is poetry to talk about our experience. Some of it is just more accurate than others. And this is, this is the deconstruction of orange into green is to knowing that all of that is just one way of talking about things. And it's not the only way of talking about things. And it's only the best way of talking about things in certain contexts. In other contexts, Poetry is better. You can use religious symbolism in a transrational way, and it's going to be more effective because humans are storytellers. We're narrative-driven creatures, which is why I think it can be such a struggle to learn about rationality in these theories is because they can tend to be and feel a little bit cold. But the reason to make these distinctions is out of deep care. I think a lot of people have a sense that in the end, they have to side with their own instinctive poetry. And it causes them to underappreciate the value of the objective and the rational based on this idea that if push came to shove, they've got to go with their story. Even if they've been able to tease apart, you know, archetype from stereotype and have a higher embrace of it, there, there's something in there. The thing that shines forth to them as valuable, both in their impression of the world and in their personal mystical insights and visions, I think there's a, a, even a kind of moral sensibility in people that in the end, on my deathbed, you know, in, at three in the morning, I've got to side with the story that compels me the most. And in the daytime with other people, sure, maybe I try to talk rationally, and that's okay for making toast. But in reality, I'm going to have to back up into the thing that seems the most me. How do you feel about that? I talk about these symbols of the cup and the sword, and they're intertwined because, so let me first say the cup is poetry. It's this life-giving, vital, feminine, the womb of the goddess. And drinking that, it like helps us really feel alive and get in touch with our true selves, the mystery of reality and the mystery of ourselves. And then there's the sword, the flaming sword of truth that cuts through the bullshit and separates the passing from the eternal and separates and cuts. And, and, and this is the much more masculine kind of energy. And people tend towards one or the other. But to me, they harmonize. Like, and we said, even the sword, even rationality is rooted in poetry. And good poetry makes sense. Good poetry resonates really hard because it aligns with what's actually true, Right. So like a lot of these people who are like, oh, I couldn't just be, you know, a biological machine or there has to be free will, you know, all these kinds of things like their life couldn't just be inherently meaningless. All, all, All these things, they sound like bad poetry to people. But when you can really understand them. They can, the, this can be really good poetry too. Like the fact that there's no inherent meaning in the cosmos and that meaning is something that we've created that we make means that life is an art piece that we can create meaning together and we can make things how we want them to be that we're not just pawns in some kind of cosmic game of chess that that we're just victims to play out or whatever 
Um, there's, there's ways in which even the scary stuff that people don't want to face or don't want to look at is actually beautiful. Like the fact that all of this is just nature in flux is amazing. Like people's idea about uh, the supernatural and wanting more and wanting there to be magic and all of this stuff, it undervalues nature. It undervalues how amazing life is, how amazing it is that we're even able to have this conversation right now. So how do we handle pre-rational people who are, by all estimates, the vast majority of human beings? Right. We can't just say to them they underappreciate the beauty of science and nature. Right. And they if, if there's any chance of, of them becoming rational beings, that's going to take time and effort. It can't be demanded immediately. And in the meantime, they have an inherited packet of poetry that represents to them some intelligence about the universe that they do not yet consciously apprehend. Yeah. What's our proper relationship to that? Well, this is where understanding spiral dynamics is really important because you have to understand first where a person is at in their unfolding development. There are people who are new to a stage and they need to spend time in that stage to really learn its values and its lessons. And there are people who are stagnant in a stage and they are closed minded and they are not going to move and they don't want to move. And then there are people who are more close at, closer to the exit. They know about what's going on in that world. They've, they've seen its values and its pitfalls and it's not serving them anymore. And it's starting to break down and they're starting to outgrow it. And these people need guidance and help and challenge and support. And it's a big deal to take that on. You know, Wilbur is constantly saying like, we don't know why people transform. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> we, it seems, it seems like we, we understand what's going on here pretty well. Like, I mean, I don't know if we can say in detail we understand why, but it, it seems like we understand how people move through these stages and to some extent why they get stuck and why they can break out and all these kinds of things. You just have to talk to people and, and really take the time. One of the things I really want to develop in this next year is a explicit method. Like I've already kind of, I have the outline for it. I just need to make the video. Basically, it's like different stages of engagement to go through and what to do at each stage when you're engaging with a person. But at first, I think it's a lot of evaluating a person, asking them questions and validating with them, like giving them validation in the things that they're good at, letting them know that you see them and see their value. And also the reason that it's mostly these two things is because you want them to see, to feel seen and heard, give them a chance to speak, want them, you want them to feel listened to. And it's also building this tension of mystery because the more they talk, the more they invest in what you think of them. And the more they're talking about themselves and you're not talking about themselves, it also builds up this mystery of like what you think and all this. And if you're seeing the value in them, and validating them in their project, they become more and more interested in what you think. So there gets to be this point at which you're gonna challenge something in their worldview. And I think it's good to pick your battles. You know, There's a whole spectrum of, of things that you could choose to engage with that they're giving you. So I think a good place to start is with something that seems less complicated, more simple, less fundamental, and challenge them on it. Tell them what you think and then see how they react to it. See how they deal with it. And if they're kind of closed-minded and they shut off and all these kinds of things, well, maybe you need to, to take more time or maybe they're, they're not necessarily the best, they're not ready yet, maybe something like that. Uh, along the line of the wisdom of picking battles, yeah, uh, but like a little more personal here. In hindsight, you know, looking at yourself over the last few years, <laughs> what battles do you think you might have picked that maybe you shouldn't have picked? Like, where have you tended to be? Actually, here's a better question. Where have you been too hard on people? And where have you been too soft on people in dealing with the integral community? 
That's a good question. Just to put a cap on that last thing, I think if sure. you can make progress with them on a small thing, that creates goodwill and then you can engage with them further on in maybe more complicated things. I think we got to be patient with people. It takes time. They say on average, it takes five years for a person to move through a stage. And so we need to take this into account and, and realize how long it took for us to grow. And, what I like about that yeah. is the validation point. Um, you know, we'll get back to that question in a minute from before, but um, there seems to be a cycle of input to output, right? And I think a lot of people, even in higher communication communities, are stuck on still needing the validation. They need validation about their own transcendental experience or their own visionary experience or their own uh, clarity about how important rational is, right? But there's a step beyond. You have to somehow get that validation so that you move forward to become the validator and start to be able to go to the other people who are entering the community and say, yes, that's right. Here's why it might be right. Let's keep talking. Yeah. I, and, you know, it, if people feel seen and they feel like you actually can value what they're about and their project, they're much more, I mean, they're much more likely to engage with you. I think it's important to try to move from the inside. Like, I don't think that it's, it's generally not the way to go to come at a person in a, in a combative way. It's always more effective to move a person from the inside. So if I'm talking to a Christian, I'm a Christian. And I, I am a Christian, so that's not like a lie or anything like that. I, now, how do you I'm, hold that in that discussion? When you say you're a Christian, are you I, identifying very precisely with their Christianity, or are you holding a much broader frame in which, even unbeknownst to them, you're not quite agreeing? Like, right. Here's a discussion exactly. I had with this old lady one time at my cousin's birthday. Nobody wanted to talk to her because she kept talking about Jesus all the time. It was very off-putting. But if I talk to her about the Lord, which in my mind is a very general concept, <laughs> then we could have a discussion in which she could even tell me something very interesting that I didn't know about the archetype of the Lord. She just right. thought I was talking about Jesus. So yeah, I joined very much her, like but that. I also didn't join her. There was an irony to the structure that I brought that she was unable to see. Exactly. What I'll often do is I'll tell them, what it means to me to be a Christian. And that seems to be effective because I can usually get them to agree with me. I know the places of agreement that I can find with Christians and I can use those as fulcrums or pushing off points to help them expand their concept of Christianity. So like I would say, you know, I would point to this verse in the Bible where God's going to separate out the ones that really understand him and versus the ones that he never knew. You know, this, this verse about like um, on the day of judgment, he's going to cast out these ones and they're going to be like, but Lord, we prayed a million prayers and we went to church every Sunday and we cast out demons in your name. And he's like, yeah, but when I needed a place to stay, when I was hungry, when I was in prison, you didn't help me. You weren't there for me. And they're like, but Lord, we never saw you or, if we would have, we would have helped you. And he's like, look, if you can't recognize Christ in your brother, then you never knew me. Get away from me. So this is a good, this is, this is quoting scripture to a Christian mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, rooting your definition of what it means to be a Christian in the Bible and in the, the story. And it's like, look, it's not just about saying these words, you know, it's about recognizing Christ in your brother, seeing that your body is a temple for the living God, dying to your, your ego, to your flesh every day and living as a vehicle of love in the world to other people. That's, that's very what, uh, prophetic that's, in the Judeo-Christian sense, right? That, that whole book seems to consist of chapters in which somebody comes forth and says to the people that their understanding of their religion is inadequate. <laughs> and here's how they should really understand it more deeply. And then that yeah. person becomes enshrined in the text. Yes, this is, I think this is the way in general to move people forward, is to not say, tr not try to take their thing away from them, but to push into it more and be like, okay, so I love God. Like, what can we really say that we know about God? You know, am I just worshiping a mental idol when I think that I, a flimsy human, can know God? And then what does that say about the gospels and the way that they've come to us and all the ways that men have 
influenced and perverted this text over the years and how much can we trust it? And now by the time we've gone down this rabbit hole, we've pretty much <laughs> you know, undone our concept of God, the authority of the Bible, and maybe now everyone who talks about God, who thinks they have a relationship with God is actually being real and sincere. And God isn't reducible to our local symbol set or, or our regular way of thinking about them. Now I got them into a version of green Christianity that even deconstructs Christianity. So, I mean, you can use the tools within the symbol sets to undo them. What you just said there, you transitioned from, uh, <laughs> I got rid of their God to, uh, we found some much better meaning for God. Right, exactly. So for you personally, like how often, how often do people get hung up on the first half? What's that like for you to try to have those discussions where people get triggered by the first half and think you are just a reductionist denier and they don't hear that segue to the second half all the time? Is that something that happens to you? Well, you get them to agree with the premises along the way that will inevitably lead to these conclusions. Usually when I'm talking to Christians, I'm pretty good at setting it up. And yeah. I was raised really Christian. And so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the Bible. Like I've read the Bible straight through six times. That's not counting like the regular readings in church. And like my dad used to have the dramatized version of the Bible that he would just like play on a loop. So I'm pretty familiar with the text. So you're well-versed in that. What about yeah. in other Christian community discussions? Other, because that's that where I imagine people hear that first bit and they're like, ah, he's a reductionist. I don't have to listen anymore. Yeah. Well, coming back to your question about the integral community and, and this kind of stuff, I'm a very passionate person in general. And um, I definitely came into the community with expectations about what I thought it should be. And how I thought we should be treating each other and talking to each other. And I was disappointed. <laughs> we'll, we'll say that. And I don't know, in terms of picking my battles and the kind of character I've become in the community, I would say that I was less careful and more passionate. I would, I would say, well, maybe not more passionate, maybe less skillful in the, in the beginning of when I first joined the community. I don't necessarily regret any of the videos or anything like that that I've made but certainly in like we were discussing before in Facebook uh, debates and things like that I, there are probably plenty of situations in which I could have been more skillful but in, in a there's this really good uh, Joseph Campbell quote that I like where he says that when the God when God comes to you if you're open and you're honest and you're ready, it feels like bliss. But when God comes to you and you're not ready and you're not open and you're clinging tight to what you currently have, God comes to you as the angel of death, as the destroyer. He is going to cut you into pieces and rip and rip away the things that you love. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so sometimes when you become someone's shadow, I almost flip on them. If I'm their shadow monster and I'm their angel of death, I'm going to make an impact. I'm going to make sure that they remember <laughs> this moment. <laughs> I want them I want them to be triggered by it I, because the way that my understanding of the shadow works is the more you push it down, the bigger and bigger and more scary it gets. And so, and there's different roles that people play in transformation. So if I become this big, scary shadow monster and I really, really upset you, you're going to go to somebody who's wiser than you and you're going to tell them about this and you're going to tell them about how, it hurts you or this upset you and then maybe they'll talk some sense into you and they'll be like yeah i can see why this is upsetting to you and yeah maybe they shouldn't have been so mean to you but they're kind of right about this at least and <laughs> and you do kind of think this way so i mean like i i guess what i'm saying is 
we all play our parts. And there's a way in to, to me to figure out what part I should play, depending on how the person reacts. So if I am having a, a conversation with somebody and it's all good and they're respectful and they're reasonable and they make good arguments, even if it's not about being right or wrong, it's about how you engage. But if you're closed minded and you're ignorant and you're mean and you're fighting your shadow, I'm going to call you on everything. I'm going to point out every way you're going wrong. And I mean, I'm not going to insult you personally or anything like that. Like there's definitely a line and it, and it can be a little bit, it can be a little bit gray sometimes too, because like, let's, let's say we're talking about Trump, right? If I say Trump is a, is a liar, that might sound like an insult, but it's also a fact. <laughs> so it's one thing to be like, this is what you're doing and this is why it's unskillful and wrong and illogical and not good for communication. And you're being, you know, willfully ignorant here, or you're doing this or you're doing that. Like that's one thing versus like insulting a person personally and dismissing them and all that. So to me, like you can be harsh and also giving honest feedback and engagement. And I would say, usually, if you're seeing me get into it with somebody <laughs> in, in the community and I'm being harsh with them, it's because to some extent they've earned it. And I I've like tried when it happens in a complex way. Yeah. I like when somebody gets triggered, but the thing that triggered them or the person who triggered them is actually much richer than the triggering. So that when they come back later, they might discover there were things in there they didn't realize that might not lend itself to the triggering interpretation. Um, yeah. I do think there's a role for the kind of interaction you're talking about, for sure. Um, this element of challenge in a variety of ways has to be present throughout the community. Um, yeah. Subject of myth, you know, I love Joseph Campbell. I loved him as a boy, let's say. I grew up watching Star Wars, so I love Joseph Campbell. In your mind, where are myths? Well, to me, I think this is a really interesting question because we play out archetypes. We become archetypes. Like, I, like that, that, that idea, like all the world's a stage, right? Uh, even the integral stage. Um, it's everything we say is we're speaking in stories. We're telling stories. Like all we, I would say to some extent, you know, like a lot of what, we have is myths. Almost everything we do is myths and playing out myths. So like I would say, you know, even the, the story of the Big Bang is a myth, like we spoke about before. It's just a more rational and accurate and, you know, uh, self-consistent type of myth. But yeah, I think we're, we're telling stories and playing out stories all the time. Does that answer your question? I think so. I think it, um, it doesn't get to the question I think a lot of people themselves would wonder which is is there a place is there a a stratum of reality in which the patterns of myth are encoded that we access or not but i think uh i think your answer is a very good one that um the location of myth is in our embodied activity in the yes. storytelling that is cooperative with our behavior yeah it's in all four quadrants and that's why it's a little bit hard to pin down because they all influence each other and even our, I would say, even our ideas about archetypes in some sense is like a Rolodex for the kinds of experiences that we've had in our life. You know, like, oh, here's a banana. And you're like, okay, now I have an idea of banana. Some bananas are green and some bananas are brown. And that, knowing that expands your Rolodex card on what, it, what a banana is or what a possible. So it's like we've, we collect all these things in our mind, all these ideas based on our experiences or things that we've been told or seen or something like that. And so, I mean, you know, for me, it's, it's kind of rooted in reality. Yeah. Reality is, uh, it, it's tricky because there's obviously a way in which the mythic, the simplistic, the irrational mythic imagination, imagines that the stage of its imagination is actually something like the cosmology of the physical universe. And then there's this other tendency to abstract myth into the psychology of individuals. 
And then there's this other attempt by some people to say that it's something like um, computer code or um, the general realm of complexity and algorithms, that there are these underlying patterns that might not be like the perfect chair that Plato imagines inhabits the realm of forms, but right. there might be something there, a particular structure that we can't see that shows up a lot in the universe that isn't just inside our minds, but which we might, a lot of us see as a chair is because of our background as humans. This goes back. Those in... structures are there underlying our experience of archetypes. I think it's confusing because so much of the stories and poetry that we have about it seems true to us. Like that, like you brought up Plato, his idea about the forms is good poetry for the kind of psychological Rolodex that I'm talking about. A lot of the stories that we tell that we cling to or that we really like, even about creation and stuff like that, they ring true in other ways. And so I think we get a little bit confused around that. I think that's where there's like these early, mid, and late stage vision logic mm -hmm. having to do with different levels of complexity in terms of understanding both ego and construct awareness, different levels of deconstruction and reconstruction around these things. But I, I agree with you. I think that there's definitely different perspectives on it. And a lot of that goes back to the kind of fundamental worldviews that we're holding the things in and that it can be talked about in the language of different quadrants, like you're saying, you know, it could be talked about as this kind of software that emerges out of some kind of hardware or that's reflecting on some kind of like real world stuff or something like that. It could be spoken about in this more poetic way, like it's this realm that we're accessing. And that makes sense in a first person kind of way of talking about it. And it could also be, you know, like, like you're saying too, is like these kinds of codes or these these patterns of the universe. It's, it's hard to talk about because we basically end up getting all caught up in all of these different metaphors mm -hmm. that we try to use to be able to understand our experience and how we relate to reality. So what happens is that the, the words both hide and reveal different aspects of the truth. Yeah. The symbols all become like this illuminating thing that can help us to understand things, but also this limiting thing that boxes us off in this particular way of thinking about it. That's I think why it's very important, like you said, to have that realization that it is hard to talk about. Yeah. Right. And if it's transrational, it should be hard to talk about. And right. you know, one of the forms of etiquette for the community between people who come in with different perspectives is that it should be something that you can only half get your hands on using language. If it's not something like that, you're probably not really having a transrational discussion. That's right. And I think we need to be more, more skeptical and humble and open in our position to really have some intellectual honesty around this stuff. Because when it comes to claims about the nature of reality and how things came into being, these are not things that we should feel so secure in. Like, I consider myself to be a, a hard agnostic when it comes to the absolute truth or a lot of these things. Like, I don't know. Um, I can tell you what it seems like to me. I can tell you what it seems like we've established through our best science and theories and, and time thinking about it and, and looking at it. But it's, in, it's amazing to me how um, so many spiritual people will say that science is arrogant and scientists are arrogant when these are the people who try to have the most intellectual honesty around some of these topics. And it's usually these more spiritual people who just take these bold claims about the nature of reality for granted as some kind of a given and then continue to assert them as if they know that they're true based on some kind of spiritual experience. You know, Wilbur talks about this idea of deep science and using peer review in your spiritual communities with your spiritual experiences. But it seems to me that you don't really get good peer review through these kinds of things because there are plenty of people, like with the Buddhist injunction, for example, there are going to be a lot of people who you could get to get in. You could tell them the methodology and they could get into the state that he's talking about but they're going to interpret it in terms of their worldview. That's the Wilbur Combs matrix. 
And what also happens is that there are people who might even be in the community and a part of, they might be Buddhist, but they don't agree with the conclusions that these people are coming to. And then what happens is their perspective is just dismissed. Like, oh, well, that's because you're not mature enough or awakened enough. And just, just keep doing it, keep practicing. And then when you agree with me, then you'll have arrived. So there's a lot of really dishonest and unskillful communication coming from a lot of the people who hold the more idealistic perspectives. It's not well appreciated that the experiences and the communication are, are somewhat independent in terms of the development. So that a right. person could have a very developed experience and not be very developed at communicating it. So when you know, like That's if a I have too. a level seven experience and then I go around asserting to people that I had it, maybe I'm using a level three communication style. And when everyone says that's only level three, I freak out because they're not validating my legitimate level seven experience, right? And there's a lot of problems like that in communication where people just don't think of those things as separate. And it makes a real difference in terms of uh, charting someone's development because your stage of development and your ability to recognize your stage of development and your ability to articulate what you've recognized may all be quite independent variables. Well, if we're looking at the Wilbur Combs matrix, I don't know if we can say that there is such a thing as a level seven experience. I would say that there's a level seven interpretation of an experience, mm -hmm. but states are horizontal. The, that's why I really like this idea of the Wilbur Combs matrix, even though he seems to negate this distinction in the way that he talks about it in other places. But the idea is that states are horizontal and free and that anybody could get into any kind of state if they practiced or worked themselves upright. And that we can only interpret that experience with whatever kind of language and worldview that we're talking about. Now, some lines run ahead of others, you know what I mean? So maybe, maybe there is a way in which a person, but usually the cognitive line runs ahead. So it's like the way that, that it seems to work is that like with, with, with some kind of an amazing experience, let's say it's like, I understand with my knowledge in my cognitive development that we're all one. Right. And then let's say I take some kind of psychedelic drug or something like that. And then I have like the experience that we're all one and I realize it. And it's like, Whoa, like we're all one. Holy crap. <laughs> and then then it takes time for you to learn how to live like we're all one and to really like realize that in your actions every day. But, you know, maybe there's, there's something like a spiritual line or something like that. I think part of the reason I'm, I'm hesitant with around this kind of stuff is because it seems like Wilbur has in his meta analysis of development Basically, we're looking at different lines of development that are studied and measured by different developmental psychologists, Piaget, Lovinger, Graves, you know, all, the, all these people who have thought about it. And if you, if you look at some of these maps, what Wilbur has done is he has stacked Aurobindo's state stages on top of Piaget to create this kind of third tier of potential, like basically... And I, I think this is wrong. Not only is it wrong in terms of meta-analysis of, of psychology, like I don't think, I think you're kind of comparing apples and oranges if you try to throw Aurobindo in there with these guys. But I think it's also wrong because people experience these different states and ways of understanding them at lower levels down the spiral. And so it's not like they just come online in third tier or something like that. Like no, people... I, I agree that the, the <clears throat> higher stages are among the least developed and least justified parts of the overall model. And yeah. we would expect that because fewer people have had those experiences. And so they're relying very heavily on their own guesses, their own experience, and the rumors they've heard about other people's experiences. And it's I would not say very they're all, well fleshed out. <laughs> I think they're also interpreting it from green and thinking that mystics represent the highest stages of development. And so they're sure. just kind of artificially stacking these things on. I'm kind of more prone to go with more of the original version of spiral dynamics 
by Graves. And, and honestly, like Don Beck is really upset about this stuff. He doesn't like it at all. He's even said that he would challenge Wilbur to a debate on these things. Um, I don't think, I don't see that happening, but that would be pretty no, epic. It would be fantastic if that happened. I tend not to use third tier myself. I don't find it terribly valuable. I think you can, you can validate all of those experiences and capacities without postulating a third tier. Yeah. Uh, and it just, it gets into very speculative territory. It could be the way to go, but there's several different ways to describe what's going on with those seemingly more advanced capacities. And like you, I'm a big fan of the Wilbur Combs lattice. Right? The, it, it's really yeah. underappreciated how rich a thing it is to consider all the states at all the levels. Yeah. And that a lot of people's experience of higher states are not really experiences of higher states, but are exactly. uh, lower level assertions of, experiences of states that always have that amazing force like a right. non-dual experience is always going to blow all your categories that's the nature of a non-dual experience right and so you could say it at every level i got all my categories blown so it's the ultimate experience right yeah right. okay that's not wrong but that doesn't mean you're at the highest level of how to interpret that right it's higher it's higher in the context of states but it's not higher developmentally like when we're talking about different stages of development in this context, in the context of the Wilbur Combs matrix, we're talking about different levels of being able to understand your experience because you include more and more factors and you understand higher and higher perspectives, including more and more factors. A lot of it is an underappreciation of what the core elements of each stage are. I think people get it mixed up with the content, right? So right. if you think of orange as consisting of, industrialism and scientific materialism then you don't think of that as including um subtle level experiences causal level experiences non-dual experiences but if you were to think of orange as fundamentally these the underlying capacity for a richer more precise more coherent rational explanation then anybody who can give that explanation of any of those states is providing an orange explanation Exactly. So I think getting the content mixed up with the level leads us to misjudge what's level and what state and where things are. And I do think that there is probably something like a third tier, but I guess my way of thinking about it is more like once you and I, let's say, would get to the point where we have the methodology that I was talking about before in terms of knowing how to engage skillfully with everyone up the spiral and we've been doing it for a real, real, real long time, that it can just become so easy, like second nature. Like it kind of reminds me of like my experience playing guitar. Like when I first started out, I had to practice and I would try to play things perfect. And then as I got better and better, I started like being able to do more improv and stuff. And then there have been times too when it's just like, it's not even like I'm playing anymore. It's just like it plays because I have the muscle memory so in place that I can just do it. I'm not saying I'm always there, <laughs> you know, but I, that's kind of how I feel about third tier. I feel like it's this kind of point in your development to where you're so practiced that you can just be comfortable in the process and that it's this kind of, yeah, that this action and non-action without attachment to the outcome. It's this kind of just unitive expression of like, well, this is what I do here and I'm going to do it good. And that's what it is. I think a lot of people know that experience from, you know, tastes and some people are very good at it. And there's a lot of confusion around how to think about it because everybody wants to make sure they leave that spot open. Right. And whether that means you've got the first tier, then the second tier, then another one, or whether it means you've got, you know, a regular reality and something else is coming down at some point to take over. Sure. Or whether it means I, I tend to like a, a two axis model where you put the second tier orthogonal to the first tier. But even on that, there's a there's a swoop point where the difference starts to get murky between the two. And you might call that third tier. I think the tiers are kind of arbitrary distinctions. Like I think that you could, you could almost do a tier at every two stages if you wanted to. I think the reason that we, that integralists talk about first tier as uh, the line between 
green and integral is because that's the major distinction that we're trying to emphasize. We're trying to set ourselves apart and we're trying to be like, well, those are all the first tier. That's all the regular stuff. This is this next thing. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you could even stick the, the, what I just called third tier in at the top of second tier and that would be fine. So, and, and honestly, I kind of think that's the best you can get is like not only really skillful and practiced at the thing, but at peace and comfortable in it. I'm not sure what's better than that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in, in magic powers or any, any kind of stuff like that. I haven't seen any good evidence for any of that. I mean, I'm open to the possibility of it, but it seems like at every point when people have tried to assert or demonstrate it, it's pretty pathetic in its ability to, to prove itself. I think there's ways to be open to that stuff. But at best, the claims seem to be that there's some wiggle room. You know, whether or not people can exert some kind of influence, it, it's within a small margin, even if they're correct. Yeah. Now, I don't and doubt that universal machines, like our brains or computers, have the ability to access almost any kind of patterning, right? If a person was to say, yeah, this guy in the 14th century went into a state and he had a city and he was suddenly able to speak Swahili. Improbable, but not out of the question because Swahili is just a code pattern. Hypothetically, it could be accessed by anyone at any time. And there may be weird things that influence what we think of as random or not random. But nonetheless, that's a far cry from most people's uh, casual instinctive belief in the underlying superpowers of the saints throughout history merely because they've heard about it or imagined it as kids. What I think a lot of that stuff is, is understanding transrational, transpersonal spiral wizards from a more first tier perspective. You know, like where in Star Wars, they're like, these are not the droids you're looking for. Like we kind of have some of these sort of powers, these abilities to like, know where a person's coming from and and do things or like activate states in people but it's not magic <laughs> it it might seem like magic from a more first tier perspective well, and what's so, what's your definition of magic well i mean there's magic with a k so in that case yeah. it's magic <laughs> um well what about i mean thinking about the force right obviously there are at the very least bioelectromagnetic fields around the body and we can have some kind of neurological influence over them. We don't know how far that could go, but maybe it could go very far in some cases. Would that be magic or not magic? Well, magic with a C, it would not be. But magic with a K, okay. <laughs> Almost anything, any attempt to influence the world by intention is magic with a K. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. A pretty broad net there, yeah. So what other things are you wanting to talk about around uh, transrationality? Well, it's a good question. I, I feel like we didn't stay narrowly on topic, but I think we meandered all over to the subject, which is pretty good. Yeah, I like that. Uh, is there anything left that uh, you'd like to say on the subject? Or wh where do you think, where are the open questions in this area still? What would you still like to know about this kind of stuff? Hmm. Well, I think one, I think there's a couple things I think we should talk about. First of all, the pre-trans fallacy doesn't apply just to the rational line. It applies sure. to the personal line and a lot of these lines, the gender line, the conventional line, all of these things. And what I think has kind of happened is that Wilbur tends to conflate pre and trans rational with pre and trans personal. So like, for example, stories about Jesus and the Buddha are both transrational and about trans being transpersonal, while something like the tortoise and the hare is transrational, but it's not really about the transpersonal. Does that make sense? Are you following that? Sure, sure. It's a, it's a poetic or a mythic tale that doesn't necessarily concern the transpersonal. Right, exactly. And likewise, you might, I mean, somebody might tell you a fact about Jesus, right? And that's not a transrational, but it is a description of the transpersonal. Right, yeah, it could, yeah, it could go that way too. So 
a lot of times when I hear Wilbur talking about trans rationality, he ends up talking about the transpersonal, like, and often Buddhism. I don't know if you notice this, notice this or not, but I feel like Wilbur is more of an advocate for Buddhism and us becoming Buddhist than he even is an advocate for integral thinking at this point. Like if no, you it's, listen- uh, It's his background. I mean, it's his practice tradition. So he's gonna lean that way pretty hard. <laughs> Yeah. When I first came across Wilbur, I would say I was giving him the uh, transrational benefit of the doubt. I think this <laughs> happens. He's supposed to be making this distinction. And so we hear him talk about unity or some, you know, Buddhist idea about, about the absolute. And we're, and we're thinking that he's speaking poetically or talking about some kind of an injunction or something like that. But then I kind of noticed over time that always came back to Buddhist symbolism with him. I think it's possible that you can be an integral Buddhist or an integral Christian or something like that. And you can, but basically at that point, you sort of become the ultimate nerd for one symbol set. And like we, like, it's like reducing everything back to Star Wars metaphors all the time or something like that. I think it can be really limiting and people who tend to do this tend to take a lot of those ideas for granted and be a little bit trapped in that one symbol set. This is why I think it's like at a trans rational level, it's good to have multiple different symbol sets to be able to understand and talk about different things. Like what's the Buddhist a skill in weaving them into conversation. You know, yeah. um, Wilbur's done us a tremendous service in, in bringing a lot of these conversations forward, but Absolutely. we're also figuring out what are the future nuances of this. And a person who in their own self and with their friends might lean into the Buddhist phraseology doesn't mean that's the one to do in the popular conversation among the community. Likewise, somebody else leans into the Christian or, you know, Bruce and I did this thing on integral Satanism. There's some people leaning into it that way or integral secularism or whatever. Yeah. Right? There's a more specific, like you're going to nerd out on something and that's okay for you as that's an individual. Fine. Yeah. Uh, because you, you need to use the things that are meaningful to you. And you got to get that reinforcement by talking to some other people who also agree that those are meaningful because that's important. But in the general community, we need a way of finessing that and staying, staying in the interinterpretive space really well. Yeah. And if we're going to be skillful practitioners and not just be integral individuals, but integrally informed actors in the world and creating, you know, potentially a future integral religion, which we should talk about it probably towards the end. Um, then yeah, we need, to, we need to not just base it on our own preferences, we need to learn about the different symbol sets so that way we can engage skillfully with more people and lead more people towards, uh, you know, help, help people with their development and to engage. We need to be able to understand more symbol sets and the different variations. It's not just about us anymore. Integral religion is a great topic and uh, Bruce is gonna do a series on it at some point. Because we need to, there's like three things at least we need to work on with that. One is, what is the stripped down underlying architecture of insights and practices uh, at its basics that any religion needs from an integral perspective? And then, how do you encourage that within any particular religion? And then also, how do you cause it to flourish in its own style? Yeah, there's a lot of factors to include. Joseph Campbell says that when a religion or a mythology or a symbol set is working properly, it serves four main functions. The first function is the mystical function, which opens up the mystery of reality to you, which is also your mystery. The key word here being mystery, because your, your ultimate name and concept and image of God is your ultimate boundary from God. It's like that mental idol that we're talking about. So being able to talk about these things in a way that holds the mystery is super important. The second function is the cosmological function, which is to inserve and incorporate the knowledge of the day. And this is where most of our current versions of religion have really suffered. They're out of date because our cosmologies and our understanding of what's going on in the world has updated so fast that none of our old religions have really been able to keep up with it. But I do feel like it's up to date enough to where now is a point in history where we could come up with a, a new religion that has a, 
a healthy and more modern or you know postmodern understanding of of cosmology. The third function is the sociological function, which binds together groups with roles and rules. And if it's not serving the second function, then those roles and rules are going to be for another time and another place. But this is important. The fourth function is the pedagogical function, which moves the individual through the inevitable stages and crises of life. So this is like your, your rituals and your, your births and your funerals and your weddings and your initiation rituals and stuff like that. So these are all important things. So we need to fulfill all those factors. A lot of people tend to be like, oh, religion is bad. <laughs> Let's just get rid of it. But that's kind of like saying... Uh, our current versions of government are broken, so let's just sure. get rid of government. That tends to be a very level-bound kind of argument, um, right? It's, it's very frequently Orange's critique of amber, so to speak. Right, right. right? From my point of view, an integral religious studies has to validate what religion is at every stage and what that all has in common. And uh, because amber tends to think of religion as large, popular membership groups, where you verbally profess a mythology in competition with other large public membership groups. Subsequently, Orange takes that on and thinks, well, I guess that's what religion is. And we either have to decide amongst them or condemn them all. But in reality, most of the religions at all of the stages were probably never called religion. Only a few of them, like that Amber approach, right? That's Amber's approach to everything. That's Amber's approach to government. That's Amber's approach to community. Large membership blocks organized around believers who assert a common belief. So that, from an integral point of view, is not specially related to the nature of religion. It's specially related to the Amber stage. Yeah. And I think that there's also a lot of, uh, in general, fear and shadow around this idea of governance and indoctrination and imposing your ways on other people in general. This is why I'm, I think if, you know, first of all, I think it's inevitable. We have to tell kids a story. We have to indoctrinate them into a way to understanding reality. And if we don't do that, we're being irresponsible. But this is also why it's really important, like what we we're saying before, to have intellectual honesty when it comes to these things. So we're not telling people things that aren't true or pretending like we know things that we don't really know and indoctrinating people into that. So that's, that's why that becomes really important. That relates in my mind to the danger of thinking new religion can be imposed top down. And I think one of the mistakes at all the stages has been to think of it as something imposed top down, which goes along with an organizational approach that suppresses people. And later when they get free of that, they hate the religion. But in my mind, historically, most of the times religion formed, it formed kind of bottom up. It was a bunch of people who uh, were able to combine a large number of different genres of experiences into some kind of coherence. Their mystical experience, their dietary practice, their domestic lives, their science of the day. They were able to weave all of that together more or less harmoniously. And that harmony quality, the coherence, was a numinous extra. It was a spirit that went beyond that and allowed them to bring that together into a style that characterized them and gave them an empowerment. Uh, so well, that could happen at any stage, at any level, with any science, with any set of cultural practices. Yeah. But it has to grow up, right? It doesn't necessarily start. People don't, I did, I'll figure out what the new religion is for people, and then I'll sell them on it. That <laughs> lends itself to that oppressive mentality. Yeah. And I think you're right that it, that it starts by people adopting it because it's what they care about and it's what they value. That's how it begins. But once you do get it codified, once these people are not just the adopters, but the parents, mm -hmm. then it does get handed top down as we teach new people and like to the next generation. Sure. Within it's like, the family structure and the community right, does right. that to some degree. So yeah. it's like, even if you could, even if you started a new governance system and it was like based on a social contract, yeah. that's good for the first generation, but the second generation is going to get it top down. But there's different kinds of top down, right? There's one kind of top down where you put, push something down and there's another right. kind where you make it available, right? Like yes. people grow up watching Iron Man. That wasn't forced on them. It was available and it fit into their level of perception and it connected them to some kind of mythic dimension 
and it was part of the community and they loved it and they went for it. That's very right. different than people banging the Koran on their forehead a set number of times each day because they were told they had to do that. Exactly. So I think exactly. going forward that the bottom up quality, it has to be honored even by the top down model. The top down model has to be ready to be a kind of model that people will suck up, not that they are subjugated to. Yeah, and especially, they don't even have to think of it as religion, right? You don't. It doesn't have to be called religion to be religion, right? People and just think of it as their culture if they want to. Yeah, and that's and that's definitely more the case from something for something like religion versus government, because government probably is going to impose itself top down, sure. and if you break the rules, you're going to get in trouble. But not so much with with the religion. That's not really imposed top down, like you're saying. It's more like uh offered and maybe encouraged or something like that i mean with governments i think there's a long way we could go in making governance um seductive rather than oppressive right there's no reason yeah. if we can make video games that create a flow experience that's addictive to people there's no reason we couldn't create a voting system that is a flow experience that is addictive to people and so forth. Yeah, I agree. I think that there's a lot of a lot of good ways that we could work on some of that stuff. And that's probably a whole other integral yeah, stage talk for we another did two time. hours just on that. <laughs> but yeah, we and we do. And we do. But let's go back to this topic of of the religion too, because I think okay. that there are still gonna be um like it, it, in an integral style religion, I think that there are gonna be universals and cultural variants and personal variants, right? So like something, some of the universals are gonna be like this general kind of transrational integrative kind of approach. But you could see how there would be different cultural variations in different places. Maybe some places lean more on one symbol set than another. And then in terms of personal variations, like I think that there are ways in which you can craft your own personal spiritual practice from this perspective there are there are certain things in each quadrant you're going to want to include to have a holistic approach to religion or spirituality but you can kind of pick the symbol set or the tradition or the way of talking about it and thinking about it or practicing about it that most resonates with you right I th and i think all those things can happen at once where you and i can both be members of this integral church where we go there and we, and we do rituals together and we hear the pastor speak or the preacher speak and we feel inspired by that. And we also have our different practices, you know, and I think the difference between like the teaching and preaching is that kind of what it is to be a preacher is to use these different stories and symbol sets to get people to see themselves as a part of this larger unfolding process to link them back to the whole religio means linking back. So to link them back to this larger story of being the universe in flux relating to itself uh, as a, as a spiritual way and in a sacred way. And I think that's what these, that's what these preachers would be doing is they'd be using stories to kind of help us to remember and to, have the encouragement and the strength to be able to go back out on our own hero's journey in the world by talking about the lessons that heroes in the past have learned. And you can pull from all over. I think we can look back over. through the history of religion and find that happening in a lot of places. Like I think yeah. that's uh, intrinsic to the nature of religion when it's healthy. Yeah. Right? Like uh, Christianity, there's a lot of different orders of Christianity with very different practices. And uh, you know, not everybody uses the Celtic cross that's very culturally specific and each individual is holding it a different way. And in Hinduism, every group and every individual is allowed to choose their own God to some degree, right? With the, yeah. the three main ones, but they're all considered to be versions of their one God. So there's a lot of that. And I think the different preachers where they've been healthy have been able to um, serve the pluralism, the implicit pluralism of their communities in some kind of edifying fashion. Now, the question for me then would be, what is it that makes a religion healthy or a community healthy at any stage or a person healthy, right? I'm not necessarily looking just for an integrally informed preacher. I'm looking for who's a good preacher in any religion at any stage, who's going to be resonant with us 
What kind of community is going to be resonant with us? How do we, what are the factors of support and challenge they need in order to come to a healthy, integrally resonant version of whatever it is they're working on? That's a great question. Well, they have to serve those functions, you know, the functions I mentioned before. It's about opening the individual up to the mystery of reality and plugging them into this grand narrative and helping to, to get them to sacrifice themselves as a vehicle for this grand narrative. It's, and it's important that they include the knowledge of the day. That's going to be important because if not, we're going to be out of touch. You know, I really like Michael Dowd. I don't know if you've listened to him much, oh, sure. but yeah, we were, we were pretty blessed to have him on the integral stage not too long ago in our sacred religions talk. And I've been a huge fan of his for a long time. When he's one of these pastors or preachers or ministers who, who really does this for me. When he's talking about aligning with evolution and being the hands of feet of evolution in the world, this kind of integral evolutionary spirituality as in, in Christian terms, Christ as a metaphor for integrity and Satan as a metaphor for all those things that align us with not living a, a sustainable life of integrity. The idea that the only way to, uh, to heaven is through Christ the only, the only way is integrity. It's the only way. And like the, the poetry really resonates with me. Now, I think in a more integral culture, in a more integral society, we would be able to use all kinds of symbol sets. We would be able to use even Star Wars and uh, Lord of the Rings and all of these other mythologies, I would think would get elevated to the level of scripture. I think as there's well a capacity as... in people to do that or not that they have to work on because in principle, people have it psychologically. If you come out of a contemporary university, you're probably pretty flexible relative to symbol sets at this point, but you may not be able to viscerally experience the sacred quality of those symbols in order to actually understand what that group is talking about. I, I often talk about mythocolloquialism, which is my my sense that we don't translate the ancient terms properly, right? The, right? the Greeks didn't worship a god named Ares. They talked about war in their language. We talk about war in our language, right? right? And, and their word was Ares. Felt, when we said war, what we think they felt when they said Ares, we would resonate with a, a, a kind of pagan or mythological quality that nourishes us and gives us a, a trans-conscious understanding of what we're discussing. This is a great point uh, yeah. about, about uh, symbolic literacy and stuff like that. And going back to what we were talking about um, religion and the bottom up nature of it, like before the rational world view was born, people spoke more poetically, like you're saying. When they said, you know, Poseidon's angry today, they didn't necessarily take it literally. So I think what happens is, is that a lot of people who wrote these original myths we're speaking poetically. And then as people are indoctrinated into the symbols, mm -hmm. they, of course, take it literally because that's what you do at lower stages of development. You, you have this kind of, you know, concrete realism or whatever. And then eventually, over time, what happens is, especially as, as you're transitioning more from these traditional stages into a rational stage, because, you know, these things take a lot of time. It's a big process, especially on the cultural level, that people start to be like, well, is this true? Is it, it's, it's literally true. And like making people be like, no, this is actually true. It's, it's really real. And then there's this kind of tension over time. It's like, is this really real? Is this not really real? And that's how I think this more accurate way of talking came online over time is through people struggling with trying to understand whether we were speaking poetically or not about a lot of the ways that we talk. And that's how we've developed a lot more accurate language. And so people in modern times look back at this stuff and they, they think about it as if these are just dumb people who were thinking about it literally, but going back there have always been pre-conventional people conventional people and post-conventional people and a lot of our myths have been written by post-conventional people wise people in a ancient you know ancient times or whatever and 
the poetry is powerful. Like I, I do believe that, you know, when some of these people are talking about these, these transpersonal realizations and stuff like that, that they're authentically coming from a very mature place for that time, but they only have the local symbol sets to be able to talk about it. This, this is where the pre-trans fallacy number one comes in. So there's, we should say there's two forms of the fallacy. The first fallacy is usually committed at orange, and it's basically when they try to reduce everything that's non, in this case, non-rational to pre-rational childish bullshit. Then at green, usually what happens is some version of pre-trans confusion, where we're not really sure <laughs> if it's rational or not, you know, like a lot of times there's a lot of confusion at green, whether the poetry we're using is poetry or how true it is or how it cashes out. And that's where you get a lot of this far-sighted mishmashing, like I was saying before, like putting ideas together that don't really go together. On the other side of that is something like more like what we're seeing Wilbur and Macintosh do where they want to conflate all the symbols as if they're all talking about Buddhism or they're all talking about Christianity. And in the middle between those two is some kind of a skillful version of integration, uh, integrating diversity with discernment, understanding the symbols in their context and all this kind of thing. Then the, the pre-trans fallacy number two is usually what happens at early stages of integral when people are still coming from a little bit of that green confusion and not, not integrating skillfully and they try to lift up pre-rational magical mythical ideas as if they are transrational or that you know that's it's like this is what i'm saying is that we're seeing around the stuff with orabindo and stuff like or some of these you know lifting up hindu creation myths or christian creation myths as if they're literally true if the first tier if we take that as a concept any one of those stages or any stage of development at all there's some kind of pre and post and in the middle facet all the way up through orange and orange is the one we usually talk about the green is what is interesting as well in the second tier kind of thinking there's a an awareness of what the problem is but a lack of complete fulfillment of enacting that insight right there's an awareness that you've got to make some kind of cut it's very nietzschean in my mind you make some kind of cut between what's degenerative and what's progressive within any given context right so when we have a concept in the community we got to look at every little piece of ourselves and each other and say, where is this leaning this way? And where is it leaning this way? Our job, once we know about the pre-trans fallacy, is to actually apply that insight to everything we approach and tease everything apart. A lot of what we need to do, especially at early stages of integral, is that we're realizing that we need to go back down the spiral and deal with our shadow and reintegrate lessons that we might have left behind. So like, I think this is kind of how a lot of us move from a more early stage integral to an integrally and a skillful integrally informed is by going back down and processing and, and doing a lot of that work. And I think, you know, a lot of times what needs to be included is a little bit more orange rationality. Um, it, it really depends on the person and, and their integration, but I would say uh, that's an important factor. And that's probably why that there's, there's uh, still conf some confusions and fallacies, even at that level. I noticed Bruce has appeared here. Hey, gentlemen. I've really been enjoying the conversation. I just wanted to step in with a couple questions or points that have been on my mind as you've been talking before we bring everything to a close. And this is something I've talked to David about before, this definition of the transrational and what's really an adequate definition of that. I agree with David that Wilbur does, in a number of places, appear to identify it with metaphorical thinking or, or poetic thinking. Um, or the ability to translate past narratives in a metaphorical way. And I think that's definitely part of it, but to me it doesn't feel fully satisfactory. It doesn't really get at the scope of what's involved in terms of my own um, experience of it and in terms of what I believe Wilbur really talks about in uh, the fuller scope of his writings. Uh, for instance, he, he places its emergence on the far side of vision logic or at least out of the context of the mature development of vision logic. And that kind of development is, is beyond what would simply be indicated by the ability to translate things 
um, metaphorically or, or, or to reframe things poetically. Um, there's a more holistic shift in meaning making and perception and uh, self-understanding and uh, meta-paradigmatic capacity. And there's a, a whole range of things that are involved that uh, I think are important to bring out. So I wanted just to circle around that uh, discussion a little bit more and, and see if I could invite uh, a little further uh, input from both of you on that. Yeah, Bruce, I think this is a really good point that you bring up. It's not really just about metaphor. So there's really kind of two points that I think I need to touch on for your answer. One has to do with a better definition for what transrational means, and the other one has to do with what Wilbur thinks about it. And this is something that we need to think about a lot because we're going to need to upgrade the integral map. We need to upgrade integral distinctions. Wilbur is really the first word on this kind of stuff. So it's up to us to be able to take this work further. And part of that means we need to do the work to follow these ideas back to their roots. You know, like we've done here, we've seen that Wilbur is talking about Campbell's work and through understanding both of those things and through understanding development and vision logic in general from this integral perspective, from a transrational perspective, from the perspective of vision logic, we can see what these things really mean. And it's not just about metaphor, because there are Christians, of course, or traditional people who, of course, would be like, yeah, the Bible has metaphors in it. But that doesn't mean that they take the story of Jesus metaphorically. They're like, yeah, there's parables and stories and metaphors in the Bible, sure. But it doesn't mean that they understand that even God, even the concept of God is a metaphor. So really, once you go down this rabbit hole, a better definition is actually something like understanding the relative nature of language or symbolism. So this is what Joseph Campbell is talking about, and this is what Ken Wilber is talking about, and this is what vision logic is about, is about understanding the relative nature of language, the relative nature of symbolism, the relative nature of stories, and of course that includes the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves and our kind of personal mythologies. So that's what ego construct awareness is about. So as we've talked about already, these different stages of vision logic, at early stages of vision logic, at green, there's the initial deconstruction, realizing the relative nature of all language, but kind of creating a flatland, right? And then at it early integral stages, starting to integrate diversity with discernment, but more for me for a, at a personal level, like how can I figure out how to put this stuff together or understand all, all of this stuff that's going on in context. And then at an integrally informed stage, having the maps, having the tools, having the distinctions and being able to live that stuff out in the world. I've heard some people suggest that instead of calling it transrational, that we call it post-formal. And I think this is a good way of talking about it too, because the rational stage is one way of talking about it. The formal operational stage is another way of talking about it, about that particular stage of development. And to think about it as like being post-formal, you can kind of see into those words what it means. It's like if we have our formal way of talking about things, then being post-formal is like seeing through our regular way of talking about things. I think a great example that I like to point to that really, I think, is a great expression of a transrational or post-formal view is this quote by Nietzsche. He says, what then is truth? A vast mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms a sum of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which after long use seem firm, canonical, and obligatory to a people. Truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that is what they are. Metaphors, which are worn out and without sensuous power. Coins, which have lost their picture, and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins. 
We still do not know where the urge for truth comes from, for as of yet we have heard only of the obligation imposed by society that it should exist. To be truthful means using the customary metaphors in moral terms, the obligation to lie according to fixed convention or to lie heard like in a style obligatory for all. He's making a claim about truth claims here. He's not saying that there's no truth. He's saying that the way that we talk about truth is wrapped in language, is wrapped in metaphor, is wrapped in poetry. So I think that we can talk about this stuff in the language of uh, Buddhism, and that can be a good way of talking about it. But maybe a better way is to talk about it in the language of philosophy and existentialism. The second thing is that we know Wilbur commits pre-trans fallacy number two. He takes his traditional symbols literally. He thinks that's the one true way of thinking about things. And he messes up the stages in light of his biases, not based on the actual evidence from developmental psychology. So that's a major problem. But another major problem, I think, is that Integral, to some extent, has become a bit of a category game. You know, like, well, that's science. That's the upper right quadrant. Like, the things like that. And then, okay, well, science is in the upper right quadrant, but if we're including science, shouldn't we also be including the best versions of science and the best versions of the conclusions that they come up with? There's a whole bunch of controversy within the topic of science. So how do we know where, what to go with? A lot of people are including a lot of things at integral, but just, just because we're including all these factors doesn't mean we're getting all the factors right. This is why we really have to continue to debate and see how we can upgrade our stuff. Is, it, is the integration really good and true? And so when it comes to claims about cosmology, we have to be using the right methodology. And when we're making claims about cosmology, that's not a transrational claim. That's a rational claim. And as Wilbur says, we need to test those claims empirically. Okay. I started thinking about poetry and the kind of basic principles of poetry and the way a person might say their heart is the moon, right? And what does that is mean? At first, it looks like a statement, but at the next level, you find that the things that were previously available to you actually contained a lot more depth. So you look into that is, and there was actually a as if in brackets that you didn't see before. So now it is, it is as if my heart was the moon. <laughs> you just have a little more freedom with it. You don't have to explicitly say that, but it's implied. Right, it's implied. Not, there's a wiggle room in all of your domains. So it seemed as if, I beheld the face of God. It was very convincing. I was convinced. But what I can say about it is that it seems to have been that. And that gives me room to move. I can discuss it poetically. I can discuss it literally. I can deconstruct it. I can ask myself what it really was or was that really was what it was. I have all this range of options available to me because I've brought the issue of semblance, the issue of the as if, the issue of adjacency, as I used to call it, into the question. So what I'm seeing there at that transrational level, when the as if, when the poetry is in play, you just have a lot more options. You have a broader canvas in which to process these experiences. It doesn't yeah. inhibit any of them. They could be as intense or convincing or more intense and more convincing than anyone else's literal assertions. Yeah. I'm not and diminishing gets... the experience in any way. No, not You're at saying all. That in order for it to be transrational, it has to have this more deft and adept and flexible holding. Yeah, this goes back to this point about translation. And this is what I'm saying. Like, trend, there's no such thing as a transrational experience. There's transrational interpretations of experience. And this is where I this is why I'm saying I think a lot of times Wilbur confuses and conflates transrational and transpersonal. Because it's one thing to have a transpersonal relation or a transpersonal experience. We can certainly have those and we can interpret it in a transrational way. But that doesn't make it a transrational experience. You can actually take the same experience and translate it at different stages of development. For example, a person might have an experience at a traditional stage of development and take it very literally. But then as they grow up, Maybe they'll deconstruct it in a rational way and think of it more rationally. 
Then at a postmodern stage of development, they might think of it more like a new ager. And then maybe at an integral stage, they might think of it more in an integral way. So there's different levels of translation, even of the same experience. So was it a transrational experience? No, there's no transrational experience. There's transrational or post-formal translations of an experience. And we're talking about it this way. We're, we're talking about the Wilbur Combs matrix and different levels of interpretation of experience. Wilbur is slippery. I'm not always a fan of the way he expresses himself, but I see him moving very fluidly between his own rational take and his own poetic take and yeah. not always indicating what the difference is. And that can be ambiguous and confusing for readers sometimes. Definitely. I mean, let me say, let me take this as an opportunity to say that I really appreciate Wilbur. He is, you know, he's my second favorite teacher only to Joseph Campbell. And I spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time digging into as much Wilbur as I could. And it was a long time before I said anything critical about him, because I really had to wrestle with a lot of these things in my own mind. And even in the ways that I've disagreed with him, it has helped me to learn. Like finding out the ways in which I think he's unclear has led me to clarity or to more clarity, I would say. So, you know, I've made videos like I'm working on this, um, this critical series of him called What You Talking About, Wilbur. And I, I try to start out the series talk, saying these things too. You know, a lot of people think that I'm mad at him or something like that. You know, I really appreciate Wilbur and his contribution. And he's definitely made a huge impact on my life. I was recently talking with, uh, I, have, I have a talk coming out soon with the meta, meta modern guys, you know, Hansi or Daniel or whatever. And he's kind of taken this, like meta modernism is kind of integral, but repackaged. Like, ah, uh, I want to divorce myself from this integral brand and this integral community and, and try to resell something that I think people will want to buy and that will work and that's not bogged down in all this kind of spiritualism. But what I've done in my project is like this idea of integral 2.0. Like I'm glad to still fly the integral banner. I'm glad to still include Wilbur. I wanna stand on his shoulders and push this project further. So I guess I'm just saying I appreciate Wilbur and I'm not expecting that he gets everything right. He's the first word on these topics and we shouldn't treat him like he's the final word. We should appreciate his contribution and take his work further. I think that's what philosophy is about. Uh, I think that's well said. And I think uh, I've mentioned etiquette a few times in this talk. And one of the things that seems like natural etiquette to me is a goodwill where you assume everybody's basically on the same page. And that gives you the leeway to assume that when you hear someone critiquing someone else, they're not dismissing that person. They're not against that person. The critique is a form of love and a form of engagement and a form of trying to move us all forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have a tendency to back off and assume that maybe somebody's being disloyal to the party <laughs> when they're offering critique, critique or something like that. But it couldn't be farther from the truth. You're engaging when you bring your yeah. good hearted critique to a project. I am deeply passionate about the integral project and, the power of our ability to help the world with these ideas. And that's why I'm so involved and so engaged. And if I, if I get upset or if I give people a hard time, it's coming from that kind of a place. It's because I'm like, no, like we need to get this stuff right. You know, it's not, it's not just no big deal. It's a big deal. All right. That's, that's a pretty good end point. I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a very like positive spin at the end. <laughs> Word. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. It's been a true blessing to be able to have this conversation with you on the integral stage, my brother. Yeah, this is great, David. And let's, um, let's get together and talk about government sometime. Let's, let's do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a great next topic. All right. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate you. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and ring that bell. You're going to want to get these notifications for the integral stage. Also, subscribe to my channel, and consider watching these videos on sacred naturalism or on states, which I am also in. Thanks so much for watching. Peace.